the weak hands are selling gold, but the price isn't moving at all. And if that happens, I think gold will actually serve as a big hedge and spike towards the 2100. And from there, it will have big days. It will have like 30, 40, 50 dollar days towards the 2200. It will go very quick. Whatever the next move is, it's going to be a huge move. Um, you're talking about two to three hundred dollars. What's up, you guys? It's Ocean here. I'm pleased to announce that back on the channel for another interview is the founder and president of Wealth Research Group, Mr. Lior Gantz. Lior, thank you for being here for another interview and making the time. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm always happy to, uh, to join the show. Thanks. I'd like to set a baseline because I'm going to ask you about any upcoming rate cuts from the Fed. When the Fed cuts rates, what have we seen that mean historically in terms of effect on silver and gold prices? Um, the traditional, conventional wisdom is that when you cut interest rates, it supports the price of gold and silver. Um, but it's, it's uh, historically not as linear as, as uh, you would think. Um, what, what really dictates the uh, trajectory of the price of, of precious metals, especially gold, is what's called real interest rates. So those are interest rates after you account for inflation. In other words, if the Fed starts cutting and at the same time inflation remain, remains sticky, then you are at a point where real interest rates are becoming negative again or heading towards negative because you have lower interest rates and higher inflation. That will be ideal for hedging your portfolio, your real estate, your savings, your everything with gold. Um, if on the flip side, inflation is plummeting and they're cutting rates at the same time as inflation uh, plummeting, then uh, it, it will support the price of gold in general because it makes cash less attractive, but uh, not to the same degree as if inflation sticks around. Um, and the third scenario is that they cut rates, they see inflation spiking, and then they stop cutting. And that will obviously... Uh, making uh, any hedging with gold very um, uh, volatile uh, is the right word to say it. So that's with regards to gold. With regards to silver, um, as it stands right now with a very low unemployment, uh, with very robust economy, uh, clearly the, the strongest economy in the world by miles and miles. Like All the other countries are, are envious of what's happening in the United States right now. Um, if you cut rates at the same time as China stimulating their economy, uh, the dollar will weaken and that actually plays very well for silver. So uh, cutting rates will do way more for silver in this scenario uh, that we're heading into than uh, for gold. Uh, that's, that's in general. Um, specifically right now, if you look at gold, I am very anxious about uh, the price action. Um, and the reason I say that is because whatever the next move is, it's going to be a huge move. Um, you're talking about two to three hundred dollars worth of a move. So if we're going down, we're going back to the high 1700s. If we're going up, we're going into new all time highs at the 22, 2300 level. The reason I say that is because of three things that you're seeing that are incredibly rare. One is the volatility. Um, if you've been watching the price closely for over a month, it's been trading for uh, at intervals of about five to ten dollars a day. It's it's literally static. It's between twenty fifty an ounce and twenty twenty an ounce, and nothing moves it. There there has been a lot of news uh, in the past month about inflation, about the ro robust uh, jobs report um, and, and a lot of Fed commentary in a Fed meeting. Nothing has moved the price from this little 
tiny range of 30 bucks with very low volatility. And at the same time, you're seeing the GLD shares outstanding plummeting. In other words, uh, the weak hands are selling gold, but the price isn't moving at all. And that tells me that a huge move is just uh, uh, over the horizon. Uh, what will determine it is whether or not the S&P 500 stops rallying. If it continues to go higher, I think gold is going uh, to have uh, a, a pretty large crash towards the low 1800s, uh, high 1700s. If, on the other hand, um, as the Fed uh, starts uh, um, approaching uh, the next meeting in, in the 20th of March, and you really start to see the line that the Fed will take, and if the Fed will take that line that is already priced in, into the uh, uh, into the uh, valuations of stocks, if it's all priced in and there are no surprises or uh, no good surprises, the market will start to really correct because we've had a tremendous rally um, in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ. And if that happens, I think gold will actually serve as a big hedge and spike towards the 2100. And from there, it will have big days. It will have like 30, 40, 50 dollar days towards the 2200. It will go very quick. Um, so, so my uh, um, my conclusion is that right now the best thing is not to do anything before you know where it's going. If the price goes below 2000, let it fall and wait for better prices at uh, you know at the 1800s. If it breaks out to 2100, you're better off buying at 2100 because the risk is the the risk of this being a false breakout is almost zilch. So you know what that you're buying with all of the momentum of Wall Street behind you, uh, and that's why I say like a wait and see approach right now is the right approach. Thank you. Right now, it's I think it's reasonable to expect one or two rate cuts in 2024 from the Fed. But is there justification for more more cuts, maybe four to five? And if you're inclined to address what the total number uh, may be, if if you could also add what you think the basis points cut in 2024 from the Fed may be, um, I'd love to hear about that. So right now, um, as we as we speak, let me tell you exactly what the market is thinking. And I mean exactly. So right now, in March, March 20th, uh, uh, the market is not uh, pricing in a cut. The probability of a cut is 17%, meaning 82% believe rates will stay the same, which means they will stay the same. Uh, the Fed won't surprise 82% of Wall Street. In May, right now, it's 38% that they leave uh, rates the same, 52% that they uh, cut by, by a quarter percentage point. That it is shifting <coughs> all the time towards uh, no cut. In other words, it was way higher than 52% for the cut in May, and now it's only 52%. Hmm. Where there's a consensus is in the June 12 meeting, where only 7% believe the rate will still be uh, 525. In other words, in May, th there's still debate, but in June, there's no debate. The Fed will start its rate kite cycle in June, and in fact, um, it's so priced in that in June, there's a higher percentage that they cut by 50 basis points. In other words, in June, we're already at 475, a full half a percent from where we are right now, than, uh, than just a quarter percent. So the market is thinking that if they jump on the May meeting to give themselves more time, that by June, they will realize that they can cut by half a percent. Um, and then it goes on for the rest of the year 
until December, where the the terminal rate for 2024 right now is either 4% or 425. So the market is pricing in a full percentage point lower than where we are right now. Having said that, uh, the Wall Street Journal just released a, a pretty interesting article called Investor uh, Investors Are Almost Always Wrong on the Fed uh, Rates. And uh, they show all the rate cuts and the rate hikes uh, in, in the last 40 years and how projections have been all over the place. And so I think that... Um, what, what can we really bank on? What we can really bank on is that right now, uh, interest rates are as, as high as they will get. We're not going to hike any further. That's for sure. It's very restrictive. You have a problem with commercial uh, real estate that's uh, owned by, or the loans are owned by regional banks. You're already seeing a lot of stress there. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the housing market is dead. It's frozen. Um, if you look at um, the cost of borrowing for the federal government, it's obviously very high right now uh, with the Fed funds rate at 525 and the 10 year at about 4%. Um, especially when you're trying to, uh, when the deficit is ballooning, like ballooning in, in, in unprecedented pace. Um, and so, Rate cuts are definitely coming, but it's a question of how much. Now, there is a, a second side to this argument. The second side of this argument is that the longer they wait here at these higher levels, that the longer they risk that they're missing on slowdown in the economy. And when they do start to cut, they're going to need to cut into uh, higher unemployment, uh, a slowdown, a mini recession, etc. And I remind you, we are the only, or the U.S. is the only economy in the world that's currently functioning well. China is in a full-blown recession, maybe even a depression if the, if the stimulus package doesn't work. Europe is whatever. Um, there are many issues around the world uh, in, in the Middle East, Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, so, Latin America is, is uh, breaking apart. In in Africa, we have a lot of uh, uh, wars that are happening, conflicts. There's more conflicts right now than in any time af uh, uh, after World War II. 40 different areas in the world right now are seeing conflict. And so, to me, uh, uh, I don't think that the Fed waits for too long. And I think their biggest risk is that inflation doesn't come down all the way to 2% and settles around the 3%. And now they deal with a very stubborn inflation in the United States, which will weaken the dollar and keep rates higher for longer. Thank you. Very insightful. Um, the other big topic I wanted to ask you about today is deglobalization. And I have to compliment you on your content, your newsletters have been one of the earliest sources referencing the state of deglobalization our world is moving toward. What is the, the thank you for your content. Um, the, the newsletters have been great. And by the way, um, everyone definitely subscribe to the Wealth Research Group newsletter. Leor, if I can get a, a link for that, I'll put it in the description so everyone can find it. What is what is the real deglobalization story and what should we all be doing to prepare? Okay, great question because it is the biggest questions of our uh, it is the biggest question of our time. Um, once the Soviet Union fell, there was an opportunity for the United States to lead um, the, the, the free world um, into, a stage of hyper-globalization where you connect all of the economies of the world and into, into a global village. The problem 
that occurred, and, and the reasoning behind it is if you create dependencies between all countries and trade between all countries and ideas are shared between all countries and money flows between all countries, I mean, the the opportunity is, is, is amazing. You you can eradicate poverty. You can you can do magic, but you can't buy friends. And in 2001, uh, the United States saw the first slap in the face of this idea, where countries that are uh, that didn't see America as the liberator, but as the intervener, uh, attacked on U.S. soil. Um, in response to that. America wanted to show the world we will not entertain attacks on our soil. So they went, you know, they went for the uh, for the projection of power first, and they stayed for the oil. Um, what I think uh, happened around that time is hyperglobalization really helped China become a formidable power, and in that context, the United States forgave China on many uh, accounts, on IP theft, on reverse engineering, on on, uh, on on bribing academia in the United States, on many uh, on many fronts, uh, until they realized we have a, a genuine threat here. This is not just a, 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 tra a huge trading partner. This is a foe. This is an enemy. Um, and... and when Trump came to office, he really ended globalization. He said, look, this is no longer working. We are literally buying friends, and those friends are taking our money, taking our middle class jobs, and they're not they're not grateful. They're, they're doing everything they can to sabotage us. So he started with tariffs on China, which essentially are as symbolic as it, as it gets to the end of globalization uh, because you, you end free trade. Um, secondly, he, he had a famous UN speech where he said all NATO countries now need to, uh, don't, to, to put 2% of GDP, not just the United States uh, funding NATO. Every, every NATO member, you want security, you need to, to chip in and you need to militarize. We're not going to do the heavy, heavy lifting for you. So he literally uh, dissolved Bretton Woods with that, with, with that UN speech in 2018. Um, then, uh, later on, he started working on the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords in the Middle East, their purpose is was for the United States to be able to exit uh, a lot of its uh, uh, aircraft carriers and other... And, and, and military and bases and everything and focus on China more than on the Middle East. Those were the Abram Accords. Um, and the the cherry on top was supposed to be the normalization between um, Israel and Saudi Arabia. And because that didn't materialize, maybe because Trump wasn't elected um, or maybe because um, of, of uh, several factors that have to do with how Biden uh, wanted to normalize between Saudi Arabia and Israel. It took his time, um, it, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. We uh, we are now at a point where uh, deglobalization is rapidly on the way. What really showed you that globalization is over is the pandemic, because the, the pandemic was a global crisis, a global crisis and a slam dunk for globalization. All the countries of the world could have united and built a unified plan on how to solve the pandemic. And every country went its own way with its own agenda. China zero COVID, uh, Sweden kept, kept it open the whole way, uh, Australia prison. So every country different. And I think that that showed you Globalization is done. It's over. And so when you exit that, where are we? What is deglobalization? Deglobalization means four main things. One, you cannot trust any agreements that you have right now with other countries. Russia on, uh, you know, 
on one morning decided we're invading Ukraine, we're shutting uh, natural gas and oil to Europe. This was like the biggest agreement for 35 years. Russia supplies Europe with natural gas and oil, or, uh, uh, and, and Europe pays good, reliable money to Russia to run its economy. This was like the, the golden ticket for everybody. Done. Uh, the the Straits, the Straits of Bab and Mandev, uh, the Persian Gulf, the Suez Canal, they are kept open. No one disrupts them. And the United States Navy will take care of anybody that, that screws around over there. That's over. You have the Houthis um, that are sitting literally on one of the biggest choke points for maritime shipping and are causing shipping companies to go all the way down to Cape Horn in South Africa and all the way up to Europe, extending not only shipping time, but uh, shipping insurance, the whole thing. So deglobalization is the end of the American-led uh, attempt at a miracle, which is to create uh, some sort of a global prosperity um, where the threat that you face is that America um, will will punish you for, for not participating in the prosperity, be it sanctions, be it war, whatever. <clears throat> That's why a lot of Americans always blame America for war, for instigating war, because America has the role of uh, referee. Uh, it, 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 if, if you want to have a fair game, there needs to be a very brutal referee. Uh, that looks at, at the top. But if you take away that referee, which is what's going to happen right now, now you will see the real nature of these players. And if they're violent and, and, and barbaric and volatile uh, or not, you will see now the cultures of all of these countries which were kept at bay because you had a brutal referee. So that's the trade-off. All, all these Americans that love isolation, and just want America to protect its borders and not intervene, they will now see what happens. And if the players actually flip on the ref, uh, and and um, I remind you, the last time the players flipped on the ref was 1963, when uh, the Soviet Union had the brilliant idea of putting nukes on the, the island of Cuba. So we shall now see what happens when you lift those global agreements that America put in place. And when I say global agreements, I mean the Bretton Woods system, the World Bank, the IMF, um, uh, all of these agreements that you have in place, like the World Trade or Organization, um, the SWIFT system, everything that uh, that led to globalization. So how should you position? That was your big question, and now I want to get to that. In this deglobalized world, you're not creating a world where every country is, is for its own. So deglobalization means the end of globalization and the beginning of regionalization. You're going to see regions. And so for Americans, one of the biggest opportunities is in the new relationship, the newfound relationship with Mexico. Mexico is already has already surpassed China as America's biggest trading partner, and this is only going to in intensify. So... If your business is not um, is not moving in the direction of working more closely with Mexico, or if you as an entrepreneur are not looking at opportunities with Mexico, you should. Uh, that that country is going to be the new China for the United States, um, and it's important to understand that there's there, billions will be made, and billionaires will be minted, and millionaires will be minted, etc. And and you know, wh whatever profession you're in, look at how this impacts you. Mexico and its relationship with the United States. Um, that's one thing. When Mexico is tapped, uh, uh, Latin America is the next big beneficiary. So think about that as well. Think of how you can position uh, with all the growth that will come to Central and South America as they support the United States more. Of course, Canada uh, to, to a degree, but but... Canada is much more mature than uh, these countries where, you know, some of these some of these uh, areas you can buy a piece of land and it will be worth 20, 30 times what it is when it becomes a logistics center, uh, uh, center or, or a service farm, uh, sorry, a server farm or an industrial center 
or a, or a piece of uh, important highway, it, it just or factories, etc. Um, within the United States, I think that everything around the Mississippi River is going to flourish again. The Mississippi River is the world's best transportation and shipping and logistic route. If you have a, a, an opportunity to be part of the resurgence of that, uh, I think that that will be incredible. Anything that has to do with um, uh, equipment for ports, for ships, this is all going to get revived. It's been neglected for over 100 years. It's going to come back uh, in, in, in an incredible pace. Uh, the United States is gonna is gonna reindustrialize, and that means a lot. Um, Americans sometimes, because they live in America, it's almost like the fish in the fish tank, right? He doesn't see the water, but America has the most adaptive and unique economy in the world. People in America, they they not only switch careers and switch jobs, they switch states. They are so adaptive to changes in the economy. In Europe, if you want to tell an employee that he needs to move from Rome to another city in Italy, it could take him two years to even start to think, oh, I don't know, I don't know, it's a big move, I don't know, I don't know. In America, you tell somebody, hey, you've been re relocated, you're not, you're no longer in Austin, you're in our uh, California branch pickup, you're there in a week. He's there, that's it, it's done. It's so adaptive and so agile and, and um, and that's why it's the, it's the biggest economy. It's it's the most you know innovative economy and everything. Uh, if you're looking for the future, the future is either in America. The motherland is in America. Um, because think about what globalization was. Globalization was uh, sacrificing America's middle class in order to create a prosperous uh, uh, world. In other words, you're giving up. You're you're 100 giving up competitive advantages for the sake of having uh, a, a better global economy. Now that's that's ending. America is uh, going to see a huge surge in uh, GDP, in growth, and in, in innovation. Uh, a lot more businesses will come here, um, and it's it's kind of hard to believe, right, for Americans because they've been you know. The globalization has put the national mood in, in such a slumper. But, man, you have the best oil in the world, the cheapest oil, the best equipment. Uh, you have everything you need. And America is the model. So, but if you're not American or you're looking for other ways, I think the connector economies are going to be very important as well in the, regional, in the regionalization that we're moving into. What are connector economies? Those are economies or countries that are able to stay neutral and serve both the Chinese-led bloc and the U.S.-led bloc. And, you know, if, if, if you're able to tap into those opportunities, I think they will be meaningful as well. Uh, Poland is an example of that. Uh, they, they will be critical for NATO and its allies, but they are also very critical for, for China as, as a way to... Uh, to get to Europe, um, I think that you will see other countries that play a big role. Those connector economies could be big. Japan is going to be huge, huge uh, in the regional regionalized world. India, already a monster. It's going to be uh, even bigger. So there are many opportunities. And like I always say, it's, it's, it's more about, certainly as an American, it's more about... Um, uh, it's like it's like there's a wealth train, and it's always on the move. The wealth train is always on the move. It does. It never stops. Never. It, it, it every, every day when you go to bed today, you wake up tomorrow. There will be more millionaires. Millionaires are printed every day in America. So the question is, are you on the train or not? That's the big one. Many Americans feel left out. Um, and once you're on the train, which crate? You say crate, right? Yeah. Which crate are you on? Are you at the back? Are you at the VIP? How do you move from crate to crate? That's one of the the big uh, uh, the big complaints in America that you can't move now from poverty to wealth. The American dream is over. But just 
remember what I'm telling you. It's alive and well. There is a way to jump from crate to crate and get to the front. It, it the the way to get there is not by going to college. It, it it the real the real way to get there is about understanding what's happening right now in America with uh with the industrialization of America again, where the opportunity where the puck is going with opportunities. And you know, for me, the best way to uh to align with that opportunity is to take three days out of a, out of a month. So I know it's a lot. It's it's a, it's a ten percent of your life, but at least for the next year or two, take three percent of your life. I'm uh, sorry, ten percent of your life, three days a month, and go to conferences and meetings and networking, because you will find what people are doing, where opportunities are from from business people, not from your friends or your neighbors who may not be entrepreneurial or not. You know, or not the type of people that you, you know, that maybe you want to leave that neighbor. You want to go up in life. Go to conferences. Go to networking. Go to events. Learn and network with people. It could be as simple as a real estate event. Uh, it could be a, a, a robotics event, a, 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 a conference, an electronics conference, anything. Learn what is happening in America. And that's part one. Two. Find your ideal partner in there because uh, I think in the world we're moving into, without partnering, business is so tough, so tough, so demanding that it's almost impossible to succeed. They asked, uh, I will just finish with this because I know all my answers have been very lengthy. They asked the founder of NVIDIA, he's genuinely one of the best businessmen ever, right? They asked him to they asked him two weeks ago if he would do it again, having known everything. He said, I would never in my life choose to do this again. I have spent I have spent thousands of hours sleeping on, on the couch at the office. I have, you know, I've sacrificed everything and it's just not worth it. Literally. So if the if if the Founder of NVIDIA tells you that it's that difficult, that it's that demanding, and with his capabilities, you need a partner. I'm telling you, you need a partner or two to to build that synergy and take the load off from you. Um, so, network for the knowledge and network for the partners for the partnership. Do this until you get those results. I know three days out of a month is a lot. But look at your local area, at your backyard. What you know, where where's the real estate club? Where is you know where, where do they conference? Where are the big conferences? Maybe it's an hour away. Maybe it's a two hour. Maybe it's a flight away. Maybe you can take your spouse on a weekend to Vegas. There's a lot of conferences happening in Vegas. Network, network. Well, you heard it here first. That was incredible. Um, I definitely urge everyone watching this to. Subscribe to the Wealth Research Group newsletter. Give it a try. I read it in the morning um, as I'm starting my day, and it's really succinct but information-packed. And, Lior, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Stack wide as the ocean.